Hello there. I'm Haslinda. I'm an anchor of Bloomberg TV and chief international correspondent for Southeast Asia. Thank you for joining us from wherever you are. I hope you're well. And uh, for today's discussion, our topic is globalization 2.0, and we're hoping to make it interactive. So we'd appreciate if you send in your questions for our speakers. Well, the pandemic has accelerated the transformation of globalization. Borders have been shut, supply chains disrupted, impacting everything from trade to tourism. Many are expecting a reconfiguration with a move more towards perhaps regionalization or re-nationalization. We heard from Stephen Roach. I mean, he said recently that trends in global trade are flashing warning signs. And if you take a look at data from the IMF, it seems to suggest that growth in annual trade has averaged about 3% from 2009 through 2016 versus 6% previously. So, have the business and investor landscape changed forever or will the same opportunities return once the dust settles? Let's start the conversation going. I'd like to introduce to you Farhan Farooqi. He's CEO of International Banking at ANZ and would like to take an industry perspective, get his insights. Uh, Farhan, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. First off, Farhan, uh, we're in the midst of this pandemic and amid the crisis, the world is getting more and more fragmented. How does the world look to you? Is this a world in reset? Yeah, I think, you know, Haslinda, the, we're, we're in a world which uh, uh, one of the uh, more prominent political commentators in, uh, in the U.S. has described as a G0 world. Uh, one where there's effectively no real leadership um, and that's causing multiple challenges, including lack of coordination. Sort of the coordination we saw during the global financial crisis is not what we're seeing today in the COVID crisis. So that has certainly caused fragmentation in terms of, uh, in terms of how countries and the world is reacting to the current COVID environment and the economic crisis. I think the one thing that the, some of the governments have done well uh, although not on a coordinated basis, but in general is the fiscal stimulus that they have applied, uh, which has allowed uh, the crisis to have a more muted uh, immediate response from an economic standpoint than it would otherwise have been. But there still remains a huge amount of tail risk in terms of, uh, in terms of the econ economics uh, and in terms of economic growth, which will likely continue well past the COVID crisis having been resolved. And I think the lack of coordinated response and the fragmentation that exists will perhaps exacerbate that. So from a business perspective, Farhan, when you take a look, all these fault lines exposed by the crisis, how do you position yourself? I mean, what are your priorities now? Well, our, our priorities from a banking standpoint, uh, uh, I'm assuming that's the question you're asking us, Linda, is are, are really much more mm -hmm. focused on making sure that we do two or three key things. One is, you know, we, uh, we ensure that our business is well positioned to serve our customers which means from a technology and operational resilience perspective, that's our primary focus. And we've spent, uh, we've learned a great deal from this COVID crisis. We've had as many as 95% of our workforce working from home, something that was unprecedented before. Um, we've served our clients during a period of severe liquidity shortages. Um, and we've you know, made sure that they have been provided the facilities and the loans required to support them. We've ensured that we have helped them in terms of continuing to do trade and invest wherever they've required that to be the case. And certainly in places like Australia and New Zealand, which is our, our home markets, we have worked with the government to ensure uh, continued job uh, protection for, 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 for the people in, in Australia and New Zealand and ensure that we serve our smaller customers uh, as best as we can to give them the opportunity to survive and hopefully thrive through this crisis. So we've, that's sort of been our focus. It's been customer focused and internally it's been ensuring operational and technology resilience. And of course, overarching all of that is making sure our own people are well protected during this period of time. So that's been our focus. But as far as the world is concerned, Haslinda, I, you know, the way I look at it is that there are three, four key trends that are happening in the world, which we are focusing on. One is, of course, the geopolitical trend. It, it is a bit of a watershed moment in, the, in history, if you like, in terms of what's happening. There's, as you mentioned, there's less coordination. Growth has certainly subsided. There's a lot more nationalism, tribalism, and potentials for conflict. 
Um, and I think that's obviously driving many other ma micro trends below that, which we are monitoring very closely. Technology, of course, is a huge, uh, is going through huge change. The pandemic has been a big catalyst for change. Innovation um, and investment in digital are at historic levels. Um, mm. You've seen, you know, in some ways, the technology has actually been a counterforce when econ economies have been contracting uh, around the world. Uh, data has shown to be even more important and relevant to uh, survival in this in this day and age. And if you think about just things like cyber security and technology protection, companies have spent about 15, based on some surveys, have spent about 15 billion US dollars extra a week on technology during COVID. So it has been a massive uh, step change in terms of how technology has, has taken off. And I think finally, the, the key thing is going to be around trade and supply chains, and we can talk more about that, but I think that supply chain shift is now a permanent uh, uh, phenomenon. It's not a short-term uh, short issue which will survive well past COVID. Uh, technology is a very interesting point. As much as it creates opportunities and it's helped yeah. us overcome the challenges from the pandemic, the rise in, I guess, the digital economy has also coincided with the rise of cybersecurity threats. I mean, data out there supporting this. I mean, how, how do you envision overcoming the challenges? How are businesses positioned for this? Because it's been expedited. In terms of in terms of technology as an as as a phenomenon um, that we're going through experiencing right now, uh, uh, Linda, look, I think you know the companies that are investing more in technology, that are allocating more resources resources to technology, are four to five times more likely to survive in the long term. So there is no question about the fact that technology investment is going to be very core to survival as we look forward which basically means that companies have to make decisions and reallocate resources faster than anyone else in order to continue to thrive in this environment. So that's the technology side. From a cybersecurity perspective, I think every company today is beginning to invest in protecting their software and their, and their, and their data. Uh, and that's part of the overall technolog technology infrastructure that they have. So that's going to continue to get a lot more focus and attention. As I said, $15 billion of investment a week during COVID is a very clear indication of that. Um, I, I think broadly speaking, though, from a technology standpoint, there are much broader applications of that as well, including in things like supply chain. I think in, in supply chain today, uh, companies and from a trade perspective, I think the world is now looking at, you know, in the past, if you like, supply chain was, a, was really a lot more about, um, about ensuring logistic delays management, uh, managing things like the supplier's financial stability. But I think in today's world, the supply chain phenomenon has shifted to a great extent in terms of really looking at, uh, at, at uh, building resilience. And, res and resilience is around dual sourcing of raw materials, is things like increasing inventory of key components, it's about nearshoring or regionalization of supply chains so to the point you were making around globalization 2.0. Does globalization 2.0 look a lot more like regionalization uh, rather than you know, true globalization? There's also transformative investments happening in technology in, in supply chain management, including mm. things like online channels, digital and data, embedding digital tools and skills such as automation, data analytics, AI, end-to-end -end planning into the supply chain process, something that companies hadn't looked at before. And that's going to have a transformative effect because uh, there's a longer term impact, which is around inequality, because I suspect that this is going to lead to greater inequality between emerging markets and developed markets. But in the near term, it's going to fundamentally create a more resilient uh, supply chain uh, for, for across the world for, from a trade perspective. And I think companies will spend a great deal more time and focus on increasing risk management of, of supply chain, including things like business discontinuity prediction capabilities, risk transfer mechanisms, crisis planning, and things like that. So Technology is going to play a role in many facets of our lives, not just serving our customers, not just ensuring that our platforms are robust, but also fundamentally shifting things like supply chain and, uh, and trade. Uh, when we talk about changes in the supply chain in an increasingly bipolar world, for businesses, how do you balance changing U.S. rules while still tapping China's potential, still selling, being able to sell to Chinese consumers? Well, I think, you know, Aslina, my sense is that the world, I don't think there's going to be, I know there's been a lot of conversation around China's relevance from a supply chain perspective. 
I don't think that you can potentially de-risk yourself entirely from China. I think what companies will try and do is create a China plus one uh, uh, sort of system whereby they will have alternatives to China, but they will continue to depend on China to a great extent in terms of supply and certainly to, for sales purposes and consumerism perspective. If you think about the fact that most economists and and you know, I know you're going to have Farag later to speak to this, but yeah, you, you know, if you if you think about most economists, they would tell you that China would be about 75% of U.S.'s GDP by next year. Um, some predict, you know, will will surpass the U.S. GDP by 2030. Now, if you're looking at an economy of that size and scale, it's impossible to say that we will basically de-risk ourselves from that economy entirely. So, my I think there's going to be a balance that com- countries and companies will have to bring to their dialogue with China in terms of ensuring that there is some level of diversification from China, but I don't think you can take away complete dependence on China. And let me just bring in a question from one of, one of our viewers, which is uh, in relation to this, and you have already alluded it, uh, his, what is your outlook for global trade dependence on China, the short term, as well as the medium and long term? From a medium term perspective and the longer term perspective, because you talked about shorter term perspective already, how do you see this playing out five, ten years down the road? Well, I think, look, I mean, I, I, I genuinely think that, uh, you know, it, so there are two, three aspects to this, Slinda. One is the technology element. Uh, I think there is no question about the fact that the competitive nerve has been struck between U.S. and China from a technology standpoint. And insofar as that is concerned, I think that's going to survive any out- election outcomes in the U.S. and is probably a more secular trend than a cyclical one. So I think we will continue to see a potential bipolar technology world that is going to develop uh, over the next five to 10 years uh, between the US and China, basically being the two dominating players in that space. In terms of trade though, and in terms of the fact that China's consumerism is going to continue to rise over the next five to 10 years, I think that there is, I would say that in five years, countries and, and companies will have to make sure that they have either a partner in China or they have their own presence in China to continue to trade with China. Because I don't think that you can absolutely uh, ignore the, one of the largest economies in the world insofar as that is concerned. Uh, China does not have, and I don't think intends to have, 100% reliance on everything that they buy and their consumers consume, all produced within China. So there is going to be trade. Uh, and I think some of the countries in Asia, particularly in Southeast Asia, are going to be big beneficiaries uh, of that trade in the next five to seven years. Um, and, and I think the U.S. and China will probably find a balance in terms of trade, perhaps not so much a balance on technology, but certainly a balance on the trade side. There is a follow-up question here. You talked about how Southeast Asian economies will benefit or are already benefiting from this uh, disrupted supply chain. The question here is how quickly can other countries replicate the efficient supply chains that exist in China, if at all? If not, it will mean increased costs. Who will bear the burden of these higher costs? So I think the increased cost is, is frank, frankly a bit of a reality um, in, in the sense that, you know, if, for example, just you know, taking the technology example, if both the U.S. and China want to become completely self-sufficient in terms of the technology path that they take, uh, that will certainly require much greater level of investment in technology to, to effectively replace the supplies they were getting from each other. And in order for them to do that, they will have to make a lot of investment, which means that they, the cost of those products will go up in the near to short, term, in the near to medium term. And that's going to come, unfortunately, at the cost of the consumer. Now, how quickly that transition occurs will determine ultimately where we end up in terms of, uh, you know, the final cost to the consumer. But there is definitely a short term cost to the consumer that's likely to come. From a, from a trade perspective and supply chain standpoint, if companies move locations and if they build new plants and new equipment, in different countries, even though the longer term view is that they're moving to continued short, uh, low cost environments, the initial investment still has to be borne out and that's gonna cause a cost impact as well. So I think there's definitely a cost impact to the consumer, which might dampen demand, which is one of the reasons uh, that concerns me in terms of the COVID crisis, because it's not just the COVID crisis, but it's also the COVID crisis in juxtaposition with the geopolitical environment that's playing out that it's going to create a dampened demand environment for a longer period of time than most people are predicting. Does it concern you that the U.S. seems to be picking on Southeast Asian economies increasingly? I mean, it's already taken issue with China. It's taking issue 
with Malaysia when it comes to labor issues. It's also now taking issue with Vietnam. It may call it a currency manipulator. I mean, how, how do you view the increasing tensions? Look, I, I think there is going to be, and this is one of the, <laughs> this is one of the challenges, Aslinda, that uh, I think countries will have to contend with, is that there, is, there are now, uh, and will continue to be for the foreseeable future, two superpowers in the world. And, 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 and from time to time, they will be asked to take sides. Uh, um, uh, you know, you're either on the US side or the China side. And I think for some of the small and medium countries, that's going to be a lot struggle uh, in terms of how they're going to manage their political ambitions as well as their economic ambitions. Countries who, who, who operate in, the, in, in Asia for, for good or bad reasons have a great deal of dependency on China. And I think that from an economic standpoint, uh, some of them may have more political historic affiliations with the US. So that balancing uh, uh, is going to be very important, which is why I think a more, uni a more unified approach uh, globally in terms of uh, G3 leadership or broader global leadership is going to be critical in terms of ensuring that we don't have long-term severe dysfunctional relationships between countries, which is going to cause a bigger economic disruption than, than we expect. So I think to your point, I think the new globalization is not so much about where the supply chains are and how, 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 uh, how the raw materials move between countries. I think it's going to be much more around how globalized our leadership is and how unified they are in terms of being able to deal with these sort of uh, dysfunctional relationships. And Farhan, speaking of leadership, I mean, all eyes on the U.S. November election. Does it matter who's in charge of the White House? Because Biden himself has said that China is the biggest security threat for the world. So, look, as I said, I think that, uh, uh, you know, and, and I think when, when they talk about that in the U.S., I think it's more in the context of technology more than anything else. Um, I, and and I, as I said, I think that whether it's a security threat or whether it's a competitive threat, whichever way you look at it, I think that that, that horse has bolted, if you like. Um, and I think we are in a secular uh, cycle in terms, of, uh, in terms of the relationship between China and the U.S. on the technology front. I don't think it makes a difference who's in the White House. I think the narrative and the, the, the timeline under which certain things happen may depend on who's in the White House, but I don't think the fundamental trend is likely to change. With all the necessary pivot, disruption coming at a rapid pace, how do we retool to remain agile and resilient? Well, I think there's, a, there's got to be a huge focus on capability building. Uh, across any uh, country around the world. I think capability building in terms of automation, in terms of robotics, in terms of artificial intelligence, in terms of machine learning, in terms of data has to become the core uh, and centerpiece of education as we go forward. And I think that's something that some countries are doing better than others, but that's got to be a, a huge, big, huge focus going forward. Imagine a world, um, imagine a world Hislinda, where the larger developed global economies like the US like China uh, and some of the other uh, sort of OECD countries uh, are able to make huge investments and certainly progress their technology agenda to the point that they can actually onshore or nearshore most of their mm -hmm. production capabilities. That is gonna come as a huge cost to, our, to the emerging economies in, in Asia and some of the other parts of the world. And that would effectively create a huge amount of uh, inequality around the world, which will then spur in turn more nationalism uh, and more potential for conflict. So to some extent, I think the world again has to work together in terms of ensuring the capability build is happening reasonably evenly across the world in order to ensure that countries which are further behind have the ability to invest in the same technology and create a truly uh, a world where it in, indeed you, know, you, you have the ability to be able to keep up with technology in order to survive. So I, I think it's, it's, it's going to be, it's, it's a very messy situation that we're entering into uh, at this time. And I, that's why I keep saying, and I keep going back to the fact that leadership is probably the single biggest determinant of what global leadership is the single biggest determinant of what happens in the next five to 10 years. Yeah, sometimes it feels like there is a leadership vacuum in the world. Uh, Farhan, a question for you. There needs to be a proportionate spend in cybersecurity for a resilient digital economy as you uh, spoke on earlier, how much 
it ends at spending on cybersecurity as part of its digital transformation spending. Is, is there mm -hmm. a, a number, a figure? <laughs> I, I don't think I have a number to give you just now, but I can <laughs> certainly assure you that that is one of the top priorities for us. I mean, look, we, we are obviously investing in digital capabilities and making sure that our, our, the access to ANZ is simplified as much as possible for our customers. But there's an equal attention, if not more, to the fact that we protect the data of our customers and that we make sure that we are protecting the, fact, the, 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 the bank from any cyber, cyber threats. So that we have a we have a we have entire bus, entire business dedicated to cybersecurity. Uh, we look at we talk about protecting our people as well as our, our data from that on a on a regular daily basis. There's a huge amount of internal education around cybersecurity threats. Uh, there's a lot of crisis planning around cybersecurity situations that might occur. So there's a there's a massive amount of focus on that, and that's not just in our bank, but I would argue that's in most companies in the world today, uh, because it's a very real and imminent threat. Uh, so I think we will spend, to answer your question, simply as much as we need to, to ensure that uh, we're protecting our, our customers and our people. I'm just going to push it just a little. Could you be doubling? Are you looking at a third? I know you can't give a figure, but just a sense of how much more you're spending. I, I actually don't have the numbers with me, Aslinda, but I can tell you that okay. from five years or six years ago to where we are today, that number has far more than doubled in terms okay. of cybersecurity. Before we let you go, I just want to get you to look into the crystal ball. How will the world look like in five years? And that's long term, I suppose. I mean, in this day and age. <laughs> look, I, 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 think, I, think, uh, I think we touched on some of those things already, Aslinda. I think the first thing is there's going to be a much more intensified competition in technology, leading to potentially a bipolar world from a technology standpoint. I think we're going to see a much greater politically charged environment uh, around the world, which would include things like nationalism becoming even more intensified than it is today. Uh, I think we're going to, while well, we're going to hope for greater government unification, particularly on topics like climate change, my suspicion is that where there is slack in terms of government intervention from a sustainability perspective, I think private sector is going to start playing a much bigger role in terms of ensuring that we are looking after our planet and, and, and climate change. And I I mean, just, just at ANZ, for example, we recently updated our carbon change statement. We're working with key customers on transition plans to a low carbon economy and slowly reducing our own carbon footprint. Uh, I think digitization, automation, data in all forms and shape will become much more invested in and, and much more prevalent uh, around the companies in the world. Uh, and, um, and I think uh, there is potential for wealth, the wealth gap widening which is one of the worrying mm. issues, uh, which comes back to the geopolitical issues that I foresee. Um, and finally, I think there is going to be a fundamental shift in supply chain, as I said, near shoring, just in time to just in case sort of uh, mm. inventory models uh, and therefore more regionalization of supply chain. So I would say those are the five macro trends that, that I think we will continue to see in five years. Opportunities, but also challenges. Farhan Farooqi of ANZ, we thank you for your insights today. Do take care and keep in touch. Thank you very much, Aslinda. Thank you. Now, President Donald Trump's trade war with China has challenged the old order of free trade. Countries can no longer depend on overseas trade to boost growth in the same way they did before. So how do we weigh the economic cost of a partially broken, globalized world? What are we already seeing? What are we likely to see? Who will bear the brunt of it? We addressed a little bit of that with Farhan earlier. I want to bring in Emma O'Brien. She's Bloomberg's managing editor for Global Business Asia. Emma is based in Beijing. Hi, Emma. Hi, Haslinda. You know, we talk about how uh, the U.S. is moving its industry out of China, out of uh, Germany, uh, Rather, it's moving its industry out of China, but you know, Japan, Germany doing the same way as well. How does it change the structure of the global supply chain? What's our own reporting telling us? Well, I think uh, Fahan and you really touched on that uh, earlier, that there definitely is this political push very strongly from various countries, not just the Trump administration, but Japan, you mentioned, uh, India quite strongly trying to, to lure in particular 
um, electronics manufacturers uh, to diversify or move out of China and, and come back home, in, as the case may be with the US. I think the situation for companies on the ground, particularly those with a very strong supply chain presence uh, in China already, um, is they're not moving as fast as that. There might be that political will, uh, but they're in a situation where they've taken decades to build up these supply chains and it takes a long time to make the decision uh, to move them again. Um, I think the pandemic has illustrated that relying so heavily on a place like China, particularly in the early days uh, of the virus when China did shut down um, and that did paralyze aspects of the supply chain, uh, you know, really has brought that home to companies. But on the flip side, uh, there are a couple of really key factors that uh, they really rely on China for. One is the highly skilled workforce that they've been able to build up here um, through the education system, through the support of, of the political system here, um, the really intricate supplier base um, that they've been able to build up as well. A factory isn't just, you know, a, a standalone factory uh, making mobile phones, for example. It's a web of, of complex supply chains, often within China itself, providing the cogs and the wheels and the chips and the different pieces mm -hmm. um, that come in to play. And then uh, you also touched on that a little bit earlier. There is this whole factor of the appeal and lure of the domestic Chinese market, um, which, uh, which also is a deterrent for fully decoupling or fully moving out of, of China. Um, you know, you've got uh, companies like Tesla, for example, that, that are doing the opposite, um, setting up their, their first factories here. Um, you know, they're, they're the first automaker to be able to do that without a, without a JV here in China, because this is their biggest market and they're looking to export from here. So I think it's the, while there is that political will to regionalize uh, the pace for companies um, isn't quite there because there is so much at stake. Like you said, I mean, we, we heard from Ken Rogoff. He says that globalization or deglobalization will have growth everywhere. No one will be spared. So I guess the, the question really is it worthwhile then? Do the gains from decoupling from China justify the move? Is there anything that suggests that it could work out when you get it sorted? Um, I think Fahan really touched on this about, about how companies have realized that they were too exposed to China, that they are too exposed to China, um, that we have relied so much uh, as an economy, as a world economy and society on, on China creating so much of what we consume. Um, and I think that uh, companies are realizing that they can't have all their eggs in that basket and they do need to uh, move to a diversification strategy where they might not make everything in China, but they might make bits and pieces in different places, some of them closer to where their markets are, some of them um, in places where they can get the, the labor force that they require, um, some of them where the cost factor is more important. So you will see, uh, you know, things made in a variety of locations and then constructed in one place closer to the market, um, more than what you've had over the past couple of decades where everything made within China and then sent abroad. You touched on India earlier. Is India possibly the closest to dislodging China as a manufacturing superpower? And if you take a look at our reporting, uh, is there a sense of when this could happen? Well, um, I think Bloomberg Economics did a study on this maybe at the end of last year where they looked at, you know, where is the next China? And India did come out on top, mostly because of the scale um, and the home market there. You've got uh, by 2025 uh, McKinsey estimates that there'll be uh, more than 85 million middle class households there. That isn't, you know, comparable to, to what China will be at, but it is uh, a very appealing and nascent uh, market. But there are issues. Uh, with India that, that mean you can't just automatically plonk what you've had 
um, in China there. Uh, you don't have that, that highly skilled workforce. The education system is not set up like it is in China to, pr to produce uh, people skilled in trades. It's, it's a much more sort of one track education system uh, where people, uh, you know, at sort of the top of the pile are all aiming for university rather than more of a stratification where you have people going into trades or technical training, that sort of thing, which is much more prevalent in China. Um, besides that, uh, you have uh, a complete, you know, almost lack of, uh, of the infrastructure that you have in China in terms of supply chains, supplying some of those things that manufacturers need, um, plus uh, a, a real sort of bureaucratic block there as well. We, we talked to um, an executive that, that runs Toyota. Um, in India a couple of weeks ago who talked about um, the real block posed by taxes there um, to them really expanding or getting any real scale um, in India. So it does really put the uh, spotlight a little bit more onto Southeast Asia, onto economies that look a little bit more like China's in terms of labor force um, and political structure. And, and that's where Vietnam uh, and to some extent Indonesia tend to come out uh, a little bit better. If you're tracking developments in China, we have to talk about uh, its dual speculation plan as a policy. I mean, there's very little on that for the moment uh, until it reveals its five-year plan. What does it mean, you think, for the global economy, bearing in mind that China is said to be the largest economy by 2024? Yeah, I mean, I think there's been a lot made of uh, this push toward dual circulation, but I think people forget that this is something China has been working toward for a, for a couple of years. Uh, they've just given it a sort of um, interesting and potentially impenetrable name. Um, but I think China has realised that uh, it, it does need to be less reliant on outside forces, particularly as the head and power of its local consumer base grows. Um, I think that, um, you know, they have gained a lot of expertise over the past couple of years. There is that technological that, that you guys uh, discussed, technological gap still there. Um, and, uh, and I think you do have a situation um, where, you know, um, the West does still have a, a very long-term advantage. Uh, China has struggled with innovation. If you look at, for example, um, plane making, uh, the, the local plane maker, Comac, is a really good example of, of where China has the money, the heft and the will, but not that innovation or technological prowess to be able to produce yet, maybe it will come, um, a rival to Airbus or Boeing. Um, but then, you know, you look at other aspects uh, of, of industry um, where you do see those sparks coming. For example, um, you know, lithium iron batteries, uh, batteries for electric vehicles. Mm -hmm. That is an area where you are seeing a fair bit of innovation, a fair bit of entrepreneurial spirit with the rise of, of companies like CATL, um, some of the more technological EV makers uh, here in China as well, Xiaopeng. Uh, Neo, uh, where you are seeing sort of that spark of of of, um, of innovation that you've traditionally associated with the with the, the West, but I do think that dual circulation um, is a way of saying that uh, they want to sort of tackle unemployment um, a little bit more, sort of like a way of signalling to that than it is we want to cut ourselves off from the rest of the world. I think they realise that they can't do that. Comac, Comac's time could be coming, I mean, after several failed starts, but uh, we'll keep tracking on Comac. Uh, finally, Alma, before we let you go, what's the next big thing that we're looking at for in a coverage of the global economy? Well, I think the reckoning that globalization is bringing uh, for labor is a huge thing that we'll be looking at. Um, not only do you have border curbs, um, you know, playing havoc with, with these labor flows that a lot of economies have come to rely on from Philippine nurses and housekeepers to, to Mexican and Guatemalan uh, meat workers, um, but you also have the pandemic targeting those groups, um, as you've seen um, with the virus outbreaks that we've seen in, in some of the, the, the meat uh, works uh, in the US. So I think um, this will be a real reckoning, not just for those sort of lower 
income um, worker chains, but also for um, sort of executive and expat um, workforce uh, interchange as well. And that's something that we'll be watching very closely. But also, um, I think this regionalization uh, of supply chains and, the, and the, 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 the dispersing of the eggs from the basket is something, um, and how companies actually do that while managing costs um, and, 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 and managing uh, and, and still being able to produce products and get them to market is something that we'll be really focused on. Lumbach's own Emma O'Brien, thank you so much for that. Now, we know that the U.S. is touting an America first policy. India is touting made in India. China is talking about dual circulation, as we spoke to Amar about. And the U.K. poised to crash out of the EU at the end of the year. So what hope is there for globalization when the trend seems to be turning backwards? Every country for itself, it seems, but some say, don't despair. The likes of Jim O'Neill, Jeffrey Sachs, they're saying the pandemic will not lead to a meaningful end to globalization. Let's not take their word for it. I want to do a following uh, question here. Please do give us your answer. The following question is, governments have halted the flow of people and goods amid COVID-19. Some of these barriers could be permanent. So is this, one, the demise of globalization, or two, the transformation of globalization, right? Do you think it is the end of globalization? or a transformation of globalization. While you vote, I'd like to bring in our speakers. Natalie Black is a Majesty's Trade Commissioner for Asia Pacific, and Parit Khanna is author of Future is Asian. He's a founder and managing partner of Future Map. Natalie Parag, good to have you with us. Uh, Natalie, first off, I'll start with you. Deglobalization, reglobalization, renationalization. What's your pick? Well, firstly, Haslinda, thanks so much um, for having us here today. It's such an interesting conversation and, of course, extremely timely. Um, I'm afraid I'm going to be difficult right from the beginning and, and say <laughs> I don't think you can actually pick either or uh, out of any of those three trends because what we're seeing is a, a combination of all threes in, in different parts of the world. Um, but I think you're absolutely right um, to focus on this area. Uh, because it's the big issue that not only governments, but companies, of course, are grappling with. Um, and from a UK perspective, of course, we're um, dealing with Brexit at the moment, but we're also focusing on the future. And yes, COVID has brought a lot of these issues into sharp focus, but it's worth remembering we were actually dealing with a lot of these issues last year, whether that's around supply chain diversification, which we've heard so much about, and I hope we talk a bit more, but also the opportunities and challenges of technology. And I think those two issues have come really crashing together in many ways in the context of COVID. And, and it's one of the big issues that government and businesses have to deal with. Can it fall into one of those three labels, you think? Um, I also don't want to generalize, but first let me also thank you, and it was also very good to hear Farhan and Natalie's comments. To talk about regionalism as the new globalization is on the one hand some kind of radical departure from conventional wisdom, and yet at the same time it was ever thus. And so it's a bit, you know, you get a bit of cognitive dissonance when we create this sort of sharp dichotomy, because if we look at the world today or over recent decades, most of Europe's trade is internal. Most of Asia's trade has been internal since around the mid 2000s. So to some degree, you might say this is 15 year old news. When it comes to <laughs> America, what's interesting is that owing to the trade war, protectionism, industrial policy and so forth, now the United States trades more than $300 billion a year with Canada, obviously 2019 pre-pandemic data, uh, and a similar amount with Mexico, and less than 300 billion with China. So now you see with North America, this reconcentration, but it basically joins the phenomenon that has already been underway with Europe's trade being internal and Asia's trade being internal and now North America's as well. So you have a tri-polar, tri-regional kind of trade system. That's not necessarily a bad thing, right? Uh, as we move forward and the USMCA evolves in North America, RCEP, 
uh, moves forward here in the Asian region, you will probably continue to have, uh, you know, that sort of, you know, regional focus. But there are other trends, such as the geopolitical, that point away from uh, over-concentration within one region into a country like China. And that's something that now has been repeated several times. And I want to back that up, because geopolitics is also driving this. When you think about the D10 initiative or the resilient supply chain initiative, these are forms of globalization because you are shifting or rather a recalibration of globalization and supply chains, deconcentrating out of China to spread some of that activity in telecommunications equipment, pharmaceuticals, automobile parts, and these other sectors that are being focused on between Australia, uh, India, Japan, and other countries out of China. So you are having a new set of globalization patterns. FDI is going to drive that and so on. So we have to think about not just in terms of regional versus global, so to speak, but new regional and global patterns both unfolding at the same time. I uh, touched on the issue of how it's being, I guess, spread out. Natalie, this is not the first time that globalization is under pressure. Is it any different this time? Are the stakes higher? What's your take on that? So, Luke, it, it certainly is a, a challenging time, and I, I don't want to downplay that. Um, you would have seen the same data as me coming out of UNCTAD, predicting uh, a drop of a fifth in trade this year. 40% drop in FDI, and, and perhaps most importantly for, for Southeast Asia, potentially a $100 billion drop in remittances. So the environment is tough, and for many way, many reasons, it, it feels different. Um, but globalization has always um, brought challenges for the haves and the haves nots. Uh, and I think to a degree, we'll see some of that sharpening over the coming years. And there will be a role for governments to step up and tackle um, some of those issues, whether that's, for example, on the adoption of technology and how we all benefit in that space, or whether it's a question of how we deal uh, with the um, climate crisis and maybe use this as an opportunity to tackle some of those long running issues. Hey, can I echo that if you don't mind, uh, Sunda? Uh, can, you, can you hear me? Yeah, I, I just want to echo that, you know, there, right now, a lot of economists are getting hung up on this idea of the rate of growth in trade being obviously, you know, negative at this point, but certainly slower uh, pre pandemic as well, than the rate of economic growth. And this is something that often gets trotted out as a way of arguing that globalization is slowing down or reversing. So I just want to now, in a way, almost go on the record so, you know, and, and correct this, these sort of misperceptions on how important that is, because it's quite frankly not that important. Because when you have large populations in these domestic services oriented economies, such as you have in Asia, it's not at all surprising that their rate of economic growth, given their relative level of poverty, is going to be higher than the volume that they trade. Because after all, generally speaking, poorer countries uh, are not as active in trade as wealthier countries. So it's a straw man argument. The other is that trade and services, and you know how important that is, digital services, and we've been talking so much about new digital investments that are in the growth sectors in a way. Those are undermeasured or poorly measured facets of globalization that are extremely high value. So sometimes we are the drunk man looking for the keys under the lamppost and not looking at everything else that, that's happening. And just a final point, there is still, there are these new trade agreements being negotiated. RCEP, the EU has an FTA with Japan, just signed one with Vietnam. There could be more with, uh, with ASEAN more broadly, is pushing to open up with India. Let's not forget that China is going to have to make some concessions as Europe gets tougher on them as well. And then a final point, if I may, uh, that relates directly to the climate issue. When you have a decline in the trade of oil, you're taking a couple of hundred billion dollars a year out of that global trade figure. And that's something that you might even want to celebrate and say, yes, you're having statistical deglobalization of trade partially because you've got less oil trade. And if we take advantage of the climate um, you know, agenda and actually have more alternatives or renewables domestically, 
yes, you are going to have a decline in the total value of global uh, commodities trade because of oil being taken out, but we should be celebrating that. So let's take a holistic picture of this. You know, I'm just curious. Uh, all this time we've been talking about a potentially bipolar world. What are the chances of a tripolar world, Asia, North America, Europe, all with their own supply chains? How will that play out? It, will that be a, a better reconfiguration in the longer term? Natalie. Well, so if I come in there, Haslinda, and, and uh, Parag meant, uh, missed one particularly important trade deal, which is the agreement in principle we've just secured between the UK and Japan. So I'm going to add that one to the list. Um, but uh, I think it's really important to uh, actually re-emphasize the point that both of us made right at the beginning, that you can't generalize uh, around some of the trade organization that we're talking about here. And that also applies to supply chains. So actually, I personally don't think that kind of uh, setup will work in the globe going forward, partly because one of the biggest lessons we've learned during COVID is the importance of supply chain resilience and diversification. And I very much think that diversification is the watchword going forward. And actually, what we need to focus on is what does that really mean in practice? Um, so absolutely agree with Parag's point around oil and actually how we recognize the contribution of environmental factors, for example, in the supply chain. Uh, but also, I think there's a recognition around the world that increasingly you want to make sure that you have diverse trade relations in all their forms. So that might be a combination of bilateral agreements. So, for example, at the moment we are post Japan focused on uh, Australia and New, New Zealand uh, trade deals for the UK. It might be around multilateral agreements. Uh, we've already mentioned RCEP, but the UK has also set out its interest in joining CPTPP, for example. Um, but it's also important to focus on existing relationships so that you're deepening them. Uh, the UK uh, is applying for dialogue partner status, for example, with ASEAN. We have a long history and relationship with ASEAN, but we recognize how important it's going to be for the future. Trade between the UK and ASEAN has uh, gone up uh, nearly 70% over the last 10 years, for example. Um, and when you look at um, how the economy is um, going to develop in this part of the world, particularly with a focus on technology, that will bring immense opportunities. But of course, that's not to downplay the challenges that we're seeing across Southeast Asia at the moment. All right. I'll add, I'll add to that for sure. So uh, you can imagine in some areas like food and energy, a certain amount of you know much stronger regional anchors and a diminished global trade again that would be a good thing agriculture oil and so forth are among our worst polluting greenhouse gas emitting sectors of the world economy and if we have autarky within a given region then we should actually take advantage of it and without a doubt one of the growth areas moving forward is going to be uh, agro business raising agricultural productivity in different reason regions we've seen what's happened with food supply cutoffs due to the pandemic and border closures again that would be a good regionalism but when it comes to technology and services, there's no question that Natalie is right. You will have continued globalization, a flourishing of globalization. You want that marketplace. You want competition. You want high quality goods uh, from around the world. And let's remember, and this goes back to Farhan's point, one reason why I want to sort of deepen on uh, something that he was talking about. Let's remember protectionism and industrial policy, because make where you sell this new mantra, make where you sell more or less requires that you have distributed global supply chains. If you want to sell in India, you need to be making in India, right? And uh, that, that's not the only country that is using these regulatory nationalist kinds of measures to promote FDI within their borders to allow access to those growing markets. So even if countries are not as um, you know, sort of unitary in their actions as China has been. They're certainly learning some of the lessons of how China has really hyper accelerated its modernization and development. So you will, as a multinational, need to be doing more in those uh, markets. Uh, so that does, in in a way, benefit ASEAN, not just as a production center, but also, uh, you know, in order, again, in order to access those markets, you have to, so to speak, go local. And I think that that is also going to push globalization forward as well. Uh, Parag, Natalie, I just want to give you the results for 
appalling question. 91.3% of our participants say that we're seeing a transformation of globalization. 8.7% say we're looking at the demise of globalization. So 91 saying there is hope yet it'll be reshaped in some way or form. You know, you know, in the end, I think it's really about finding a balance between self-reliance and globalization. Isn't that the case, Natalie? Yes, I think that's absolutely right. And uh, what we, again, have learned over 2020 is how unpredictable the world can be. And again, back to this watch word of diversification, uh, it gives you options and choice. But there does need to be a, a sense of, of a being proactive in this space and, and not just responding. Um, and that's why I think it's going to be really important over the next 12 months to focus um, on the climate crisis and make sure that that is a core part of the economic recovery. Um, so in the, the UK, we're the first major economy uh, to commit to zero emissions by 2050 and we'll be co-hosting COP26 next year. So we do want to be leading the debate here, but so again, I, I wouldn't play down how challenging that is going to be, um, particularly in the economic environment that we see. Uh, but there are great examples across um, Southeast Asia where we are starting to see governments step up to the plate on these kinds of issues. Um, and the um, challenge, I think, for all of us is demonstrating value to wider populations, particularly as they worry about their jobs. So how do we demonstrate that we are creating new jobs in the green economy, for example? And Parag mentioned for of the importance of agritech going forward. That, that could be a key area that we develop collectively. There is no contradiction with the two, right, Parag? Self-reliance and globalization. Not at all. To the contrary, part of what is essential, a couple of things, to maintain trust in the process of, of incremental market opening and liberalization. A lot of countries, particularly in Asia, have demanded that there be some kind of safeguards you know, for those industries that have been very strongly rooted and local to avoid being wiped out by competition prematurely. So in other words, just sentimentally to build trust, you have to continue to allow countries to feel that they have their strategic national uh, industries. And that, that's part of the political process. And then more broadly, sort of in, in principle, um, you know, again, diversity of connections is the essence in an in almost mathematical sense of resilience. So yes, we want to have that optionality in the global system. And that's what ha what's happened with the internet. Let's remember, we have hundreds of internet cables coding the ocean floor, not just three or four. And that's why the internet is a resilient system, right? Globalization functions uh, in that way. You can almost think of internet cables as a metaphor. And the more pairs of countries and continents that are connected, the more pathways you have for data to move around and a cutoff of any one or two or 10 cables does not bring down the internet. It's literally the same with globalization as a whole. And if I may, we have not touched upon finance, uh, Slinda. And remember that ultimately trade is billions and finance is trillions. And right now you have China's capital account liberalization. You have all of the money that is flowing into and set to flow into Chinese debt and equity markets. You have, you know, strong bond mm -hmm. market there with the higher interest rates. You're talking about trillions of dollars more money flowing in. If that isn't globalization, Aslanda, I don't know what is. Uh, so let's, I'm glad that your, your polling audience uh, took that relatively positive perspective around transformation, because let's not forget about financial globalization and how important that still is. Yes, we have seen portfolio capital come out of emerging markets, including in Asia, but that's also what forces governments to rapidly uh, reform and to open up more sectors to privatization, to raise the next round of global capital inflows. So the stage is already being set for what that next phase of globalization looks like in terms of the financial sphere as well. And it's every bit, quite frankly, more important than just looking at trade globalization. You talk about global capital inflows, but what impact is there? Because there's also a sense out there that globalization 2.0 will be about greater uh, social and class divides, about greater inequality, even at the other end of the pandemic. Natalie or me? Natalie, go ahead. <laughs> sure, apologies. I thought you'd go back to Parag there. So uh, I think uh, part of the challenge for all governments around the world is being able to 
articulate how the economic recovery that we're all working so hard on is going to make a difference to the person walking down the street. Um, and again, it, it comes back to the importance of jobs, um, protecting existing jobs wherever possible, um, but we know that's a real challenge, but also creating new ones. And that's where the real opportunity of technology can come in. Uh, we've talked a lot today about uh, the opportunities of innovation, and I think that's twofold. One, of course, in terms of responding to the immediate crisis, but secondly, it's also about driving the future economy. And again, if I can use the UK as an example, uh, we've seen about a 40% uh, growth in tech jobs over the last couple of years. And even over the last few months, um, we've seen a real step up in demand for tech skills to the point where we have about 90,000 vacancies a week in the tech economy. Now, across Asia, it's difficult to get similar data, um, but you do see some of the same trends and definitely around the expansion of tech companies in this part of the world hasn't really slowed down at all especially, of course, because of how important e-commerce has been to get us all through COVID-19. And we've actually adapted um, to that incredibly quickly. When you look at the um, number of uh, uh, consumers across Southeast Asia who have gone online, it now stands at about 70%, um, which has actually happened five years um, faster than many people expected. So I, I think there are opportunities that we as governments need to be communicating and sharing but ultimately uh, it's about tangible deliverables and being able to show the guy the woman walking down the street how they're going to benefit from the future economic recovery all right and, and while those are global issues that Natalie is rightly pointing out, still the conversation and the vocabulary might be similar. The conversation about this in the West versus in developing Asia is still different. In the West, you can say that you look speculative portfolio capital inflows distort markets, currencies, you know, uh, equity markets and so forth, and they don't really bring benefit. But let's remember that you don't, you know, China did not become China and Vietnam has not become Vietnam uh, with that conversation driving the agenda, right? Because obviously in the, those countries, the, the foreign investment into manufacturing has not only created a lot of jobs, it's driven industry, huge expansion of trade. This is where their uh, you know, reserves are being built uh, on the back of this. And there are spillover effects. And uh, Selena, as you know, I've been looking at special economic zones and their role in the development of Asian economies uh, for a long time. And yes, there are people who sort of, you know, uh, see those enclaves as benefiting the low cost, the companies that are trying to take advantage of low cost production centers. But there's also no denying that there's spillover effects and that it plays a key role in building those ecosystems. Otherwise, you wouldn't have the huge, you know, sort of the grow, the fast growing technology marketplaces that these economies also represent. So we do have to have like a holistic or ecosystem view of uh, the role of this investment and how it does also have these job creating social benefits as well. Let's not treat these as separate conversations. Yeah, I absolutely Apart agree. Natalie, you. just to wrap up, I'm just wondering how, how should investors and companies reframe their view of globalization, taking into account the changing dynamics? Parak, maybe you can kick it off. Well, I mean, that's a, it's a big question. I think it's partially philosophical. So let me just remind everyone that globalization has, for most of history, been an imperial enterprise. It's not really about this mythological and, you know, happy vision of one coherent set of rules that everyone equally subscribes to. It's always been a competition within uh, the sort of global uh, set of interrelated supply chains to gain the upper hand. I liken it to tug of war, right? The more global supply chains and connectivity we have, the more tug of war matches we have going on at the same time. And it's empires competing with empires and companies competing with, with companies. So it's going to remain a hyper competitive marketplace. And we should worry much less. You as a, an executive or as a head of state should be worried much less ultimately about whether or not you think or someone else thinks globalization uh, is you know, going into a hyperdrive or tailspin. What you need to worry about as a leader of a company or a country is what is your country's role in 
that global supply chain matrix. Are you benefiting or not? Are you gaining market share or losing it? Worry much more about the tangible nuts and bolts of your exposure and your strategy and how included you are in the, the rapidly unfolding world and much less about you know, uh, whether or not uh, globalization is a bright or, or kind of dismal future. And Haslinda, I, I would be even more focused than that because I absolutely agree. I know what's with, Natalie? Uh, I would agree with Parag, but I'd be even more focused and say, actually, I think the key challenge for governments and business is to really focus on future demand. What is it that people are going to expect from their economies going forward? Um, is that technology and innovation that will solve global problems? Is it technology and innovation that will solve local problems? But really understanding future needs, given everything that we've been through in 2020, is going to be key to shaping the global economy. It is about reshaping the global economy, reshaping globalization. Natalie Park, thank you so much for joining us today. I'd also like to thank uh, Farhan Farooqi of ANZ and uh, Emma O'Brien, who joined us earlier, and to you for joining in this conversation. Before we let you go, just a reminder, do fill in the survey so that we know if uh, we should go ahead with such uh, conferences, uh, insights from all experts uh, in the various fields. So please do fill in that uh, survey. On that note, thank you so much for joining us. This has been Globalization 2.0. Have a great week ahead.